بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد على ال سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم if everyone can uh, please move forward sit as close as possible i'm not exactly sure how my voice doesn't reach this part of the point, the, the part where i say please come close that part doesn't reach certain people and all this you know we're able to hear everything but that part they can't hear no, uh, so, and I don't have time to figure out exactly what the excuse of each person is. Sometimes I say, okay, this person, after my talk, I'm going to go talk to him. Some of our students too. So, but then I forget. And plus, how many people I'm going to chase down to ask, okay, what's happening? Because like right there, like it's eight feet, eight, you know, eight steps behind, just sitting in the middle of nowhere. Like subhanAllah, is it an island or what? So, come sit, some, you know, if, there's, if you need a wall, use these walls there. And uh, these, and use the chairs and everything like that. But this is not the etiquette of, our, of any gathering of knowledge or dhikr that we sit. Uh, just like for salah. Just imagine how you line up for salah. Wouldn't it be weird if you have some person praying in the middle? You would go up to him and say, khairiyat, is everything okay? So that's the reason why we should have this idea of that every single talk, every single place, just sit close together. See, these small things are so powerful. All right? These small things are so powerful. Uh, we don't, under, we don't under, uh, understand it sometimes. The power of sitting close together, what it does to you. Just like eating, uh, sharing a plate and eating together. Like what? Why would you? Actually, not only what, how beneficial people will be even averse to it. Come on. You know, why would we share a plate? <laughs> One time downstairs, I told the brothers, they were pouring, you know, giving out, pouring, giving food to the students. I said, pipe, share. So then the, the person was, yeah, on the brothers like, pipe, khana, what's your coffee here? Don't worry. There's enough food. I said, I never said that there's less food. That's why I do that. that hey, there's not enough food, so you guys need to share. Said, That's the whole point. We, the, there's so, the, you don't share because there's no food. You share because you want to bring mahabba and love between us. You share because you want to bring more barakah. Barakah doesn't mean a lot more food. Barakah means that food becomes beneficial. Barakah means that food gets you closer to Allah. Barakah means that food doesn't become a source of you. Quran called the, right? It's becoming lazy after eating. But instead, you're like, I'm energized. I'm ready to do ibadah now. That's called barakah in the food. Similarly, when we sit together, you have all the angels all around us, and mercy is descending of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us, and that's what keeps muhabba and love between all of us here as well. So, and, uh, you know, please don't get upset the fact that I keep on emphasizing this, but this is just how it is. Sitting together is very powerful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim. So we, yesterday was, they were talking about the section of a method of reformation and leaving sins. And one was the fact that people have thought that deen is about ease and comfort. Deen is about ease and comfort. And the more and mujahada is not is not good, so the, uh, 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 this is like all of these things. Like the one who doesn't understand deen, he'll say, "Why are you emphasizing sitting close together?" The one who under, doesn't understand deen, why are you emphasizing sh si uh, sitting on the floor and seeking knowledge? Why are you emphasizing uh, eating from the same plate? Yes, all these things you won't understand. But this different. The wavelength that deen works on is different. Deen flourishes under sacrifice. Some of the students who studied with us 12, 13 years ago, they say, oh, we missed the days. You know, subhanAllah, we came, early, we came a little bit too early to study. We should have come once the masjid was built. Then those who came when the masjid was around, before the seminary was built, they would say, oh man, we missed out. We should have we come here when the basketball court was there and the courtyard was there and, the, and now and the, what you call the, the weightlifting room is there. And I said, listen, you have no idea what you got. You're talking about what you missed. You actually got something what the later people are missing. The more mujahada you studied under, the greater nur of ilm came to you. And the, it, like they say, the coloring, the, the dyeing of the clo cloths. I don't, I've never really dyed, maybe some of you have, but I know how it works. Where you put it into extremely hot water, right? And you put a certain dye. Sometimes you have to first get rid of the previous dye. So then you, again, hot water is used. And a lot of lengthy process is used for the dye to take full color. The longer you keep it in that hot water, the stronger the dye will take root into the clothing. And so this is, this is how this works, that the more sacrifice we study ilm with, or the more sacrifice we study deen with, the longer lasting usually it is. 
And as the saying goes, easy come, easy go. You get the, the first money they get wasted the quickest is which one? The money of inheritance that has just been passed down. Because no effort was made for it. It never belonged to you in the first place. You never made any effort. So it comes in and we waste it. But that effort that a person puts into, into I remember one physician, subhanAllah, he had a very tough childhood and a rough childhood and he worked odd jobs and he had this car. Right? This car, I think out of the four doors, maybe two, two opened. Right? It was maybe over 250,000 miles on it. Every day he's working on the car in the masjid, the car is breaking, in the home is the car is breaking. But he would tell me, this thing, man, you can give me a Mercedes S500. Maybe I'll make money one day, I can buy one of those. But it will never mean the way this thing are. Because I have worked for every dollar of this in a very difficult, hard manner. And so this car is really beloved to me. Right? Being honest, $1,600, I think he paid for it or something like that. But that, that meant a lot for him because he, he made a lot of effort for it. So when we make effort for the deen, and we make effort for ilm, and we make effort for sunnah, then we will value it. And anytime we see someone not following the sunnah, not following the deen, it will literally hurt us. It will literally hurt us. Many of us, lucky ones, we feel pain when our children don't pray. We feel pain when our children uh, don't do their dhikr. We feel pain when our children are disobedient to Allah. That's a lucky group of people, by the way. Because there are others who don't care about that. As long as the grades are there, we don't mind everything else. But then, that's not where we need to stop at. Our love should not just be for our children. Our love and our dedication should be to Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ad-deenu nasiha Liman ya Rasulullah. Lillahi wa li Rasuli. is the first one. Deen is all about being a well-wisher and being sincere. Okay, ya Rasulullah, who should we be sincere for? Well, the first one you have to be sincere for in your, in your love for Him is for Allah. So, is this, not, is this good? Is this good that this is happening, that all these people are not praying? Who are not my children, not my spouse, not my siblings? No, it doesn't make a difference if they're related to me or not. If the fact that it's Allah's deen is being trampled upon, if the sunnah of Rasulullah is being trampled upon, then I need to feel the pain for it. That's where the level you and I need to be at. That's what he calls the sunnah of Rasulullah to feel the pain when you see the diminishing of deen. When you hear the story of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu in Hayat al-Sahaba and other books where he said that if the people, Wallahi law mana'uni iqalan, I swear if, they, if these people after Rasulullah passing away simply refuse to give the rope with all the animals that they're giving to my zakat collector. 40 camels, 20 camels, 20 goats, uh, 100 goats, how, based on how much zakat there is. But you got to give me rope. If you decide not to give the rope with the animals, I will wage war against them. Even why? How dare you bring the level down by a rope from the time Rasulullah left well, to my khilafat. It's not going to happen. Is it possible that there should, the deen can diminish while I'm alive? That cannot happen. Either the deen is diminishing and I'm dead, or I'm alive and deen is flourishing. That's how we are supposed to be. That's how we're supposed to be. So you don't have to be an imam of a masjid. You don't have to be a president of a masjid. You don't have to be a founder of a madrasa. It doesn't make a difference. You are an ummati of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You don't have to be a khalifa. You don't have to be an al-mu'mini. You don't have to be a president and a prime minister. As an ummati of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you need to love Allah and His Rasul more than anything else. And part of loving Allah and His Rasul is that all of their commandments need to be practiced. And if someone is not doing it, I need to stop them. Or I need to encourage them. And if I can't do that, at least I have to feel the pain. This is one of the beautiful du'as I heard from our teachers and our elders. Ya Allah, hamare dil mein deen ke mitne ka gham peda kar kar, ya farma kar, u deen ko dobara zinda karne ke tor aur tariqe hume sikha de. Right? Ya Allah, allow me to feel the pain of the deen diminishing. And then inspire me with solutions to how to bring the deen back. You're not gonna think of solutions if you don't feel the pain of its diminishing. That's the point. So, you know, some of us may be thinking, brother, I can barely get up for Fajr. Trust me. This is where we, if you, you have to work on this level. You know, when you go to a, a workout, and they'll put you on a workout, and say, man, I can't even run like a, a mile, a half a mile. What is this, all this? He says, listen, the trainer will tell you, this is what you, I need you to do some, not just don't worry about all that stuff. I want you to do some weightlifting. He's working on the core. And you're like, man, don't, should I have worry about other stuff? He says, no, I know the science. You just do what I tell you. We need to not just aim for the high, you need to, this is the dua we should be making now. Ya Allah, allow me to feel the pain. Because if you're feeling the pain for the deen being diminished in the world, you don't think you're going to feel the pain if you're missing your salah? You don't think you're going to feel the pain that I, I accidentally looked at something which I shouldn't have, heard something you shouldn't have, said something which I didn't have? Of course you would. 
Because it's not about me or you, it's about Allah's deen. It's not about you and I, it's about the sunnah of Rasulullah Wasallam. If we attach ourselves to the sunnah of Rasulullah Wasallam, to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's our love, then anyone, be it us, be it our mom and dad, be it our spouse, be it our children, anyone who, uh, what you call, bring, brings the level down, we will hurt us. Sometimes people will say, you know, uh, I'm practicing, alhamdulillah, my wife, it's up to her. She wears a scarf, she doesn't wear a scarf, she prays, she doesn't pray, that's whatever. You're right, you cannot force your wife to do anything. But, but, where's the pain? When you tell me that, where's the pain? In that statement. If you say, لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَلِيَدِينَ That's not the way we, that's not, that's not acceptable. If our spouse, and I'm for the women who are listening too, if you say, Alhamdulillah, I try my best, I'm, I'm regular my tahajjud, but my, my husband, I, he didn't even wake up for fajr. Okay, you can just say that and move on to the next sentence. What are you doing? Your number one dua that needs to be for your husband right now in the remaining nights and days. Ya Allah, make my husband regular on his salah. And for us, we have to be making dua for our wives. You can't get just frustrated and say, forget you. I'm just going to go to the masjid, do etika for 10 days. You roam around wherever you want to do. Because there are people who do that. That's why I'm saying this. They say, we're done. Khalas, we're done. You know you're not done. And you don't know how life can change. All the people who, people's lives change at the age of 60, 70, 50, 40. Your wife can also change. And you, as uh, those women who are listening, are worried about their husbands, he can also change. Don't give up. But it takes that, the hidden, the time is written, Allah knows when. How many, what is the percentage of the amount of time we're spending making dua for our loved ones, hidayat? Or do we just write them off to say, this is how we're going to live? Khusus, and I'll tell you, Un, the having the hair uncovered, subhanallah. Besides the aspect of, of, of you know, hijab not being done properly, and, and people's eyes falling upon them, what we don't understand sometimes is how the hair being uncovered, it, it, it's literally like when there's riots around, and there's like, you know, people looting, and you decide that night to keep all your garages open, front door open, and the windows open too, and say, child, let's go to sleep. Let's go to Whoever wants to come, come. Alhamdulillah, just keep some milk and cookies out of here too, you know? If the looters, just in case, they need some energy. Keeping the hair uncovered is like this. It's basically telling shaitan, come on over. Come on over. It's, I don't have enough shayateen. You come in. I possess me. Room over my mind. This is, anytime our satar is open, a satar is open, this is what we're doing. We're opening up the doors of shaitan to come and literally take over us. Istahu da'alimu shaitan of ansahum dhikrullah. Right? We talked about the ayah. The shaitan overtakes their minds and he makes them forget the remembrance of Allah. So this is very painful to me to see that. Right? SubhanAllah, if someone doesn't know, doesn't need, that, that's fine. You know, we need to teach them. But someone who knows the deen and says, I'm not yet ready for hijab. Or the husband says, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm in the masjid, but don't talk to me about my wife. No, no, that doesn't work like that. You need to make dua to Allah. Ya Allah, give her the, give her the strength to be able to do this. Because, and then second problem. If the mother is not going to do it, what are the chances of our daughters going to do it? Those mothers, many of our, our wives are born overseas. They saw and they were lived in Muslim countries. They got some deen in them. But those girls were born and raised here. And if they don't have the tofi to cover their hair at a young age, and they're not surrounded by good Muslim friends and a good Islamic environment, it's just downhill. So we're basically doing dhulm on our beautiful little daughters. By the mother not wearing the, the hijab, by the mother not being a good role model, and by us not making fikr for our wives and making dua for them, we are really making it super hard for an already difficult life for our girls and boys to survive. So the point here, I'm not, we're not pointing fingers at anyone here, myself or yourself or wives. Or, we are simply saying, love the deen, care about the commandments of Allah, care about the sunnah of Rasulullah and feel the pain. If you can't feel the pain, for the, for, 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 for the wife and for the daughter and for the son and for the husband, how are you going to feel the pain for the ummah when they're not following the deen? And that's where, it's not like, that's where we got to be at. Not that, oh, it's something nice. We all must strive and work on being at that level. Where when we see someone, anyone from anywhere not practicing the deen, our heart aches. Why is this happening? Allahu Akbar. You know, when there's a, when a, when a, when a, Lion is put to death in one of, in, or an animal, for, a panda bear or whatnot. Huh? The people like the panda bears, cute little ones, huh? and they don't become so cute when they become big. So th when, they're, when, they're, when they're put down, as they say, because they got sick in a zoo, it's, it makes it to the front page of the news, doesn't it? 
one front page and look jo hai they're rorans and they are gathering money and you know let's do something for this there's nothing wrong with that to feel the pain of a loss of a life it's serious it's nothing wrong with that but the idea is where should we be then when it comes to the loss of of people from jannah going to jahannam in millions and millions of people for eternity that panda and that lion is inshallah gonna, you know not going to be in hellfire you right i don't know about jannah what's the aqida that the aqida experts will tell us huh? <laughs> that more than likely the allah will say you know kuntu turaba right kunu turaba just become dust and that's the end of that but some people say i have a favorite pet ye bhi sawal aata hai ajeeb ji sawal i have a favorite cat you tell me not going to be with me in jannah Listen, if you ask Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal will create a makhluk just like that for you in Jannah and you will never think about it. Your cat, it will look exactly like your cat. But what about the soul of my cat? Yes, this is all Pushtay. What about the soul? I want that soul. But how do you know what's inside the soul? He will do whatever your other cat did, which was just basically sleep and every time you come, just spend a little time and just walk around, act like he owns the house, right? <laughs> if you want to do, if you want to have a cat like that, Allah will give it to you in Jannah. Say it now. You also there's basically matters to heal and force, and you know what's a real better answer than that because you're gonna now open up the doors for other things now. What about this? What about that? And things that are not even halal in the world. So yeah, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says matters to heal and force. Allah will give you whatever the nafs desires, but the nafs of the jannah will be different from the nafs of the dunya. Yeah, right. The nafs of the jannah will be different from the nafs of the dunya. So a person will never desire something which he shouldn't be desiring, and he will never desire something which he's not gonna get. You understand that? Because if you desire it, you have to get it. So why will Allah allow you to desire something that He's not going to give it to you? So you won't be able to even desire, you know, uh, those things which are not halal or not permissible or not clean or tayyib or tahir or something which Allah Azza wa Jal does not want us to have in Jannah. So that's a, the best answer I think when it comes to these type of things. Subhanallah. So we're talking about the aspect of sacrifice for Deen. Without sacrifice, the Deen will not run ne lekar aega. Easy, the easy come, easy go. If you want Deen to stay longer within us, then the Deen that comes through struggles and stri striving, inshallah, that's going to be uh, beautiful. So when we send our children to to uh, to uh, to uh, some place to study the Deen, for example, and they say, "Oh, Subhanallah, there was a little bit of challenge. What happened? We had, you know, now we don't have we don't get burgers every day. That askal ke mujhaat hai yeh ke burger only twice a week, not every day." So at that time, yini or better, no problem. We have Uber Eats Zindabad. Every single day, you'll be receiving the best, you know, uh, carry out to your madrasa. What has happened? We ruined that child. We ruined that child. Without sacrifice, the the child will not learn. So this is there's tough love that is required. So a child comes to you and says, "This is what happened to me. Difficult situation I came across." Okay, teach that child how to handle that difficult person in the class. Or difficult circumstance. Don't say I'm going to pull you out of school. How, what have we taught them? Nothing, right? It's just teaching them the wrong, wrong things. Teach them that you make sabr. Then quietly behind the scenes, you go to speak to whoever you need to to address that situation. But don't tell the person in front of you, your son or daughter, that I'll make a phone call. Let me just take a call and just tell the principal this and that and halas. What's happening? We are harming our children like this. I told you the story of um, Harun Rashid. His his son, if I'm not mistaken, his son's story, that he sent him to go study by one of the mashayikh and to ilm. One day, when he went to the sheikh's, he went to go pick, like you know how parents come pick up the kids. He went to go to the sheikh's house to maybe pick up his child or whatever the case may be. He goes there, and he sees the son. Who is the son? Shehzada, na Shehzada, the prince. What is he doing? He is pouring water from the lota. The jug, because they don't have taps at that time. Water, he's pouring it over the hands and the feet of the sheikh while the sheikh is doing wudu. If you ever have to do wudu outside while traveling, one person holds a bottle, water bottle, and the other you wash your hands and wash your feet. So he's pouring the water, and the the sheikh is washing his feet, right? While the son, the prince, is pouring the water. When the Amir al-Mu'minin looked at that, he got so upset. Now all of you fathers sitting here say, yeah, of course I would do too. I would get upset if I see my son do something like that. Is that what I sent him to the madrasa for? Is that why I sent him? I sent you to the madrasa to vacuum the masjid. I sent you to the madrasa to pour water for the teacher. So the sheikh, the the the, uh, the sheikh got you know a little bit worried. Like what happened? Amir al-Mu'minin, why are you angry? Why are you upset? He said, "Is this what I sent him to, to you for?" He said, "What would you like me to do then?" He said, why is my son only pouring the water over your feet and not washing your feet? 
Why did you allow him only to pour water over your feet? Why did you not ask him to wash your feet? Subhanallah. Because the king, he is not any random king. Harun Rashid is a smart person. He knows that this exercise here is what my son needs. This is what will break his nafs. This is what will break his ego. Because he's the big shot, the prince of the, you know, of the, of the uh, son of the king, man. What type of ego he's going to be walking around with? So he needs something to whip his ego and make it small. So this is what he needs. I need him go quietly and wash the feet of the sheikh. And then number two, you'll get the barakah of the ilm as well through, through, through the duas of the sheikh and so forth. So the people of the past who are smart, they understood that you need to give your child not what he wants, but give him what he needs. And those were amazing parents who knew what their parents, or what their kids needed. This is why the dua we have to make is, Ya Allah, teach us how to make tarbiyah of our children. And allow us to give each child of ours the tarbiyah that is relevant and specifically needed for that one specific child. Because all the five fingers are not equal. Similarly, all the children are not equal. And each needs a different tarbiyah. Where is that all this going to come from? You can't go to the library and read some books on this. This comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, there are books on upbringing of children that are definitely worth reading. I'm not saying, discounting that. But the inspiration, the tawfiq and the ilham to be able to make the right decisions with regards to your children instead of that comes from Allah azza wa jal. So let's not just ask for righteous, pious wives as the first portion of my talk was about. Then number two, also speak to Allah azza wa jal and ask Allah that grant me just, not just healthy, wealthy children, but then allow me to make the right decision so their tarbiyah comes out right. Which school are you going to send them to? Public school, private school, Islamic school, home school. First grade, second grade, third, fourth, fifth. What about when they get to junior high? What about they get... How are you going to make these decisions? Really ask yourself. We just say, huh, but cut say, I'm going to send them to Fulan school. Why? Because it's an elite school. Take care. I'm going to send them to that college. Why? Because it's a really amazing, prestigious university. Do you have any idea what's best for his deen? Is it really worth it? Are you willing to make this uh, any deal that I'll let him get into X program and after four years he walk out as an atheist? I don't mind as long as he graduates. I'm not giving you some exaggerated example, am I? This is happening left and right every day. So that we don't know where to send him. We don't know where to send her. We don't know if we should homeschool them or send them to Islamic school, public school, or where. And we don't know which one should send where. These decisions come, must come from Allah. That's why we have to do istikhara, salat al haja and then mashura for everything and don't take, the control, don't take the lives of your children in your own hands. Make mashura. Because each one of us make decisions based on what? Our own experiences. But your children are not who you are. My kids are not who I am. We're different. So that's why what is the best for them may not be what was best for us 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. The life continuously is changing. So for this we make mashura with our mashayikh, our elders, our teachers. And number two, very important is we do tons of istikhara for what's best. And inshallah, remember the hadith, whoever does istikhara, will, man, makhaba man istikhara, man adima, man istishara. Whoever does istikhara will never go, will never lose. And whoever does mashwara and asks and consults will never uh, get, be remorseful. Nadamat ni yogi, us shaks ko jisne mashwara liya ho. Or just istikhara kiya ho, wo kabhi nakam nahi hoga. So these are the two things that we need to hold on to when it comes to the tarbiyah of our children as well. If we look at Hajj, he says, for example, we see that these days people are looking for the five-star, first-class treatment with the most comfortable package that they can try to find. Is that the case? Yes. Based on how much dollar value I can afford, we say let's go to the best. But the reality of Hajj, hajj is hardship and struggle. Trying to remove the element of struggle from Hajj is akin to trying to remove the quality of wetness from water. Similarly, if you consider zakah, salah, or dietary restrictions, including the prohibition of alcohol, etc., you will notice that these things demand utilizing one's willpower and opposing the lower desires. There is no way around working hard. Now, this sentence here, there is no way around working hard. Do we not, do we not use the same thing when it comes to the dunya? We say that. We tell that to our children. Do you have any idea how hard I worked when I was your age? You know those beautiful stories the dads that share with their kids, right? We all share. Like, Berta, you know, if you get a C or D, how will it come? 
If you don't stay awake at night and study, guess how it come? You know, ham bachpane mein mara kya tha? Then we start, right? Which is good. It's very inspirational. We need to hear those stories. So same thing, we need to bring in the deen. That when our children say, this is hard. Ab, ab, like coming to, bringing our children to the masjid for taraweeh, or for fajr, or for isha. Yes, it's challenging. But the habit needs to be created from a young age. By the age of seven, if they're not coming to the masjid, then it's going to be very hard. Every single day, we need to make an effort to bring our children every day to the masjid. Definitely after age seven, for sure, every day. Every day. Multiple times a day. Before that, you know, for them to get accustomed to it, it's fine. For them to just sit in the back, you can hold them in your lap and let them enjoy, soak in the nur of the masjid. So that when they reach the age where they can actually come, they're interested in coming. And then if you do this regularly, from by the time from seven all the way till 15, 16 years old, when they get their own permit and license, then alhamdulillah, you don't need to tell them. They'll wake you up also on the way out. Or they'll tell you to come. Come sit in the car, we'll go. So the, it starts young. So now, mujahada to hai. He's got school, he's got this thing, that thing. But there's nothing more beneficial and important for you and I than our children being connected to the masjid. Sabse badi cheez ye hai. Isn't it? And that will come through mujahada. So we're talking about hajj now. Many of the times people ask me, but kuns acha hajj group hota hai? Right, so which is the good Hajj group? I don't listen. I don't, what does Acha mean? What is Acha? What is good Hajj group mean? How many items you have in the buffet? One of Choksi always gives this example. He said, Look, to Aapas me baat karte kete, Arafat me amne kya kha hai? to jinga ki biryani mili. He said, people, the people, What did you eat in Arafat for lunch? We got shrimp biryani. That was great. Like, really, that's your reflections on Arafat, and that's how you're going to compare. Of what, and that's exactly what's happening now. How many items you had in your buffet? Do you guys, you, some of you haven't been into these expensive packages and you haven't seen pictures. If you see the pictures, the video coming out of Mina and Arafat of these expensive packages, you have never been to a walima in your life like this. You have never been in a walima in your life like this. No one can afford a walima like that. It's ridiculous. We're talking about, like, we're talking about live barbecue of multiple items of barbecued items, multiple. From shawarmas to full chickens to different kebabs to steaks to chops. I've smelt it. I passed by it in, in Mina. I'm like, what's going on? And oh, okay, that's a certain company's package. MashaAllah, 20K, you know, 30K, and now they have full. Then I went to go. They told me, oh, you can come and speak here. You know, I went there and I was like, thank God I'm not part of this group. And thank God my time is here also limited. Right, I went to speak there. I sit there. The chairs from which you listen to the bayan. Why do we have chairs first of all? So well, anyway, we have chairs. Elders keep chairs, but if chairs, they're not chairs. This would put my chair, which is a beautiful chair I'm sitting on, is to put it to shame. It will, it, they're all golden chairs with red cushions. We're talking about hundreds of them. The scholar Bichara is speaking, a great Arab scholar, mashallah, very knowledgeable person. And how are the people seated? Go and believe it. 20 seats facing him, 20 seats with their backs to him. Then 20 seats facing him there, and then 20 seats back, in rows. 20 facing this way, 20 facing the other way. With their backs to the scholar as he's speaking. And then rows, every few feet you have a cooler. Expensive premium, premium chocolates. Premium ice cream bars. And you know, like you're talking about like these Magnum bars, like $3 a piece, like that. High quality stuff, Hagen Doss. Right? haagen and Maganam. Right? Chocolate bars. Three dollars each. You're sitting there. Then fresh fr fruit juices are coming. Oh, ye hajj ho hai. This is hajj. We're supposed to take effect from what the scholars say. Just imagine you're drinking coffee, juice, ice cream with your back to the sheikh in Mina. And then you have a full flat TV screen on top of that. That's as soon as you enter, you're seeing CNN, BBC, or whatever. You know, right there, full flat 70 inch TV screen. Last, those years they had maybe 65. Now, mashallah, we're at 78. So they probably have 78 inches this year. Okay. I mean, now people desire this. They'll, they'll say, I meet people. They say, oh, you did hajj? I did. Are you going somewhere? I, Allah knows best. I'd never tell this on their face. In my heart. Mashallah, I meet someone. Where are you going for hajj? I'm going on such and such package. I mean, kya you already paid for it. Nothing. I can't say anything. It's done deal. And may Allah Azza put barakah on your trip. But in my heart, I'm like, subhanallah. That was such a bad deal. I, if there's one place you can change, it's hajj. And if you mess up the way you do your hajj, and you do it if surrounded by materialism and luxury and just gluttony, then what, where, where's the hope for changing then? 
Because you're going to come back thinking, I've been there, done that. There can't be anything better than that. Could there be? I went for Hajj. And I don't feel anything anymore. I still don't feel love for Allah and His Rasul. I don't feel any desire for sacrifice. I don't feel all this stuff you're talking about is going above my head. But Alhamdulillah did the highest, most difficult thing in Islam, which was Hajj. And the most expensive thing in Islam nowadays. Right? So now, this is, this is scary. You've heard me say this before. That going to Hajj and Umrah unprepared is worse than not going sometimes. Because what happens? If you go unprepared, mentally you think you've done something. But when you haven't done it. And now, like you know, you're screwing a, a screwdriver. You make it, you're putting it in. If you screw it in wrong, and you make a hole there, over. If you split the wood, messed up now, right? What are you going to do? So make sure you get the right screw and the right screwdriver and then put it in. Otherwise, it's better to keep it without a screw and then putting it in the wrong one. Does that make sense? So going for hajj improperly, unprepared, without doing i'tikaf, without doing... The, I miss my advice. If you're going for hajj any year, do i'tikaf. Ideally, all 10 days in Ramadan. And if not, then three days. And if you miss that and you're hearing my message now and you're planning to go for i'tikaf and you're listening somewhere online or listening to this talk afterwards, then at least go to any masjid that have jamaats coming, etc. and say, can I do three-day i'tikaf here? Do something, but do some level of i'tikaf before you go for hajj. So these type of packages, sorry we went on that rant there, but I'm hoping at least any of you who's planning to go on a package like that, make tawbah from that. Now then you say, but who, isn't that for someone? There are certain people, literally they can't, for them that's a sacrifice. I heard like five, six years ago, this is just FYI, you know, it's nothing... I'm just sharing this with you. One of the, the uh, group, these, this uh, big shot group said, there are packages that, for, that even are on our website are the highest is 20,000. But we have packages that are not on the website. Anyone want to take a guess how much they cost? This is about six years ago. At least six years ago. 70,000. Okay? Now you're going to say, that's crazy. But who are these for? These, he said, are for the Russian oligarchs. Multi-billionaires. There's some of them are the inner circle of Putin, by the way. Muslims. Inner circle are Muslims, subhanAllah. <laughs> $30 billion guys, $20 billion guys. And he said, one of their um, requirements is, while in Hajj, they cannot see another oligarch. So we have to plan it out such, through helicopters, through underground tunnels and limousines, whatever, that the paths of these guys never cross. And I don't know what the reason for that is. But they just don't want to see each other in Hajj. Now, my, my, why I said this whole thing to you is that, if an oligarch is coming for Hajj, you know, and he's got such bad, if you pay 70,000 for Hajj, okay, bye. Because according to the lifestyle and what he's surrounded by, this is ghanimat. This is good for him. Then inshallah, ta over time, something will take effect. So these type of packages are good. Even a 20K or 25 or whatever, these things I'm sorry, may be for someone who, for, this is a downgrade from his lifestyle. And he'd never, he never has nothing to do anything with the deen at all. This inshallah may end up becoming a means getting closer to him. But if we are mashallah regular already in the masjid, you also read Quran regularly, alhamdulillah you think you have, a, you, know, you have your ideals okay, you practice the deen to a somewhat degree, then I think you can do better. I think you, you shouldn't cheat yourself by saying that no, I cannot handle mujahada. Does that make sense? So this is the balance we want to strike. Now how much mujahada? You ask, don't ask Allah for mujahada. Don't on purpose take a group that's advertising itself for $4,000, $3,500,000 three yeah? economic hajj. I, I would not go participate because I have no idea whether I'm going to even make it to hajj. Right? <laughs> and, and you hear about certain people who've taken such packages, Allah Akbar, and you hear the story. They don't even have a tent. A 115 degree temperature in Mina, and you don't have a tent, you're going to be in big trouble. I won't be able to handle that. Most of us cannot handle that. What are you going to do? Right? There, and plus, when you have the wealth, why be cheap? In everything else. So this is the other side of, other spectrum of what I'm speaking about. That don't be cheap. If you can, if you afford good car, good home, good food, then don't say, no, I'm going to get at the very bottom. And they'll, they warn you, for example, that you're going to have this, you won't have this, you won't have an AC. Don't, don't go. Don't not, please for Allah's sake, why would you buy something that doesn't have an AC in it when it's 110 degrees? I don't even know if those type of packages are available in America. Probably not. But in case if there is, don't be a bakhil. Don't be stingy. That you spend so less that you end up going there and you find yourself on a street. And you say, no, I heard to do mujahada. Because why? Ibadat kush nahi hogi. You're not, you're just going to be taking care of your, uh, uh, what you call, um, boils in your body. And trying to, you, what do are you going to do? And, you're, and, and thinking that you're not, you're not going to be able to focus on that. 
So that's why rahat sukoon itminan is good. And my own thing, I, if you spend time with me, I like to always find a you know, nice spot. In Arafat, you go in the heat. I said, ah, I can't handle that stuff. I want to be able to focus on my dua, man. I don't want to sit there, you know, being worried, you know, have an ambulance nearby for a heat stroke. Because that happened with me in my group. The first year I went, a brother, within an hour of Arafat, heat stroke, ambulance, and he was in the hospital for like next three, four days, khatam. His old hajj went down the drain. Right? So let's not be too much joshila excited. Because the youth here sitting here, we get a little excited. Like, oh, I want to go all out. So that's just um, not the proper way. You know your weak, you know your body. How much can it handle? Stand in the heat for a little bit, make dua. When you start getting your body starts overheating, come under the tree, drink some water, do whatever you need to, calm down, and you know, relax a little bit, and then continue your dua. Because maqsad in those places is dhikr and dua. And if it's not helping you fulfill that, then that's that's not good. So I, I I've said two very different aspects of this whole project, uh, this whole issue. I hope there's some benefit to all of us in there to understand. There's not it's not like there's not one straight answer for everyone. What package is good for you? I don't know. Depending on what type of lifestyle you have. However, one thing I'll tell you is whatever package you go, make sure there is a ruhani alim with you who's going to be focusing on spirituality. Someone who's going to be focusing on dhikr, dua, and allowing you to live in the moment. That listen, understand where you're at right now. You're in front of Allah. You're, at, you're in Arafat. You're in Muzdalifah. You're in Mina. You're in front of the Kaaba. Come on. Like leave all the distractions. Focus. Do your dhikr. Do your muraqaba. Do your dua. Right? Be punctual in your salah. Don't be lazy. Don't be sleeping in the hotel room all day. You need scholars who will continuously do programs, lectures, afkar, that you, where you feel spiritually uplifted. And when you're on your own in a group, that's not really good. Because most of us are not that level anyway where we can make the best use of our time. We need a more structured environment and we need continuous reminders. So I hope that helps you when it comes to choosing, you know, whenever we go. Inshallah, may Allah take us all soon, inshallah, for Hajj and Umrah. Below is some of the advice of Hakim Al-Umma Mawlana Ashraf Tanu in this regard. What does he say? He says, the cure to all evil characteristics, the cure to all evil characteristics is self-restraint and determination. Self-restraint and determination. Okay? A disciple writes about his condition to Hakim Al-Umma saying, I'm involved in the sin of lustful glances. And I always turn to repentance and asking forgiveness whenever I perpetrate the sin. Still my heart remains as dirty and filthy as ever. I'm involved in this sin, and every time I do it, I feel guilty that, I've, uh, that my eyes have war, worn off, or, or, you know, just, war, uh, what do you call that? Wandered off, and, 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 and gazed, dazed into something else where they shouldn't have, and so I seek forgiveness, but I feel like my heart remains filthy as ever. In response to this letter, Hazrat writes, the heart is not purified of bad, ha ba bad habits so quickly. Itna jaldi gandagi saaf nahi hoti. The bad habits, subhanAllah, they don't go away. You imagine you got paint on your clothing. It will not go away by washing once. Even with gasoline and all these other things. It takes time. So he says, the heart does, is not purified of bad habits so quickly. Simply by seeking forgiveness. It is only able to acquire purity and allow light to return when you vehemently restrain yourself and withhold the urge to look every time the opportunity to commit the sin presents itself. And for this, you need to have a strong determination, willpower. The bad habits will be broken not only through Istighfarullah, Istighfarullah, Istighfarullah. That's there. Istighfar, chikhne se, pukarne se, buland awas kehne se, was not enough. Do your Istighfar. But with that, the real challenge is when the temptation comes, then be strong and firm and say, absolutely not. I will not miss this salah. I will not look at this haram. I will not listen to this haram. I'm not going to fall in this temptation. When we repeatedly do this, that's when you build your internal core. Your, your, you know, your determination becomes strong. And another juncture, Tanwi Imam Tanwi Rahmatullah writes, without the firm determination, nothing can be achieved. This is the main cure for lustful glances. At the moment when the temptation arises, one should meditate upon the fact that Allah is watching them. That one of the ayats that we can make muraqaba for is, Alam ya'alam bi anna Allah yara. Which surah is this? Alaq, right? Alam ya'alam bi anna Allah yara. Alam ya'alam, which ayat number is you can let me know. Alam ya'alam bi anna Allah yara. Does he not know that Allah is watching? Kya usse patanik Allah dekhra hai? 
Think about this. Allah is watching me. What, Allah is asking, do I not know? Of course I know Allah is watching me. And another ayah you can think of, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the treachery and the deception of the eye. And what other lustful thoughts and desires are coming into the heart. Allah knows that. So these are the two ayahs that a person can think of. Or if that's too hard for us, then one may reflect, if my shaykh, mentor, and may add my ustad, my parent, were watching me at this time, I would never have the audacity to commit such a sin. Isn't that the case? If we are in front of people, if someone was with us, why would we commit the sin? So how should I be when I know that Allah is watching me? If I know Allah, when if I, my parents were here watching me, then I would not have done this. My parents are not here, but I do know someone else is who's here. Is Allah. Allah is watching me. How am I doing this? The result of his knowing and seeing me in sin will ultimately be his wrath, his punishment and reckoning on that day. If he deals with me according to the measure of justice that I deserve, then what will be my state? Agar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mere saath, adal ka faisla farmaye, adal ka, to phir mera kya hal hoga? If Allah were to treat me based on adal, on what I deserve, then what type of horrible situation I'll be in? Constant me meditation of this will lead to success, inshallah. So my beloved brothers, what are we learning from this discussion here? Is that istighfar se to guna maaf to hote hain. Sachi pakka toba, sachi pakki toba agar hum kar lein. If we sincerely seek forgiveness from Allah, our sins will be forgiven. Taib, our sins will be forgiven. But the habit will not go away. The habit must go away through strong self-restraint and determination. Wo kaisa hoga? One of those ways is that, of course, ask Allah for strength. And also learn how to do muraqabah. Like we, a muraqabah of these verses. Alhamdulillah, we conclude each dars or at least our pre, pre maghrib ones with a short, short, short muraqabah of nur by the mercy of Allah. But we can start thinking about these ayats. This is a good spiritual exercise. Did someone give me those ayah numbers? 14, 14 for Okay, Surah Alaq, Surah Alaq, Surah number, ayah number 14. Alam ya'alam min Allah yara. Or ya'alam khainat al ayyun, what was that? Umar? You, you don't have your mustaf there? Huh? Ya'alamu khainat al ayun Saad? Put the brain? MashaAllah. No? Uh, this is in um, Surah Mu'min. Surah Mu'min. Ghafir. Okay. Huh? Ayah 90? 19. Ayah 19. Ayah 19. Okay. Of which surah number is that? Ghafir, I said, right? Okay. Huh? Yeah, Mu'min. What is it? What, what surah number is it? Uh, surah 40. Surah 40, Ayah 19. Surah 40, Ayah 19. This is for those who are making notes. Insha'Allah. Surah 40, Ayah 19. I have one student, Zahullah Khaira, he made Niyya, uh, hopefully Allah make it easy for him, that to take uh, timestamps of everything. You, have you seen the tafsirs, how they've been done? MashaAllah, Marzuk, may Allah reward him and give barakah in all, his as all aspects of his life. He's painstakingly did the effort of putting timestamps for all the tafsirs that we've done this year. So one of the other brothers has said, inshallah, he'll do it for the after Dhuhr and after Asr talk. So all these things, inshallah, can be mentioned in the description of the talk. So... Yes, so making muraqaba of these two ayats, inshallah, will help. And when do you do the muraqaba? You do it regularly, every day. After Fajr, after Isha, whenever time in Ramadan, you sit and think of these two verses and say, Ya Allah, allow me to visualize this whenever I am tempted. How to build determination and willpower now? Next topic. Hakim al-Umma rahmatullah says, Strength is only built through actively using one's willpower and determination. In using one's willpower, a person does not need a physical strength. Rather, he simply needs a firm resolution to do something. Even if it means that he has to force himself aggressively if need be and go to further extents to inconvenience himself. Consider the example of a student. In order to develop academic competency, they need to actively study, research, and engage in academic discussions. If the student simply sits and waits for academic strength and intelligence to arrive out of nowhere, without any study or effort on their part, they will only be deprived. 
It goes without saying that in order to achieve something, one needs to actively and aggressively adopt a course of determination. So just like we would uh, study for the dunya, we similarly have to make effort and make niya that I'm going to do this and Allah will make it easy. So now you have three nights left. That's it, subhanAllah. Three nights left and now make a determination what you want to do. I'm going to do inshallah one hour dua, right? Every single night. Now maybe you say, I, I don't even do five minutes, but say, I'm going to do it. Say inshallah. One hour dua, right? One hour dua every night or every day. At least within the 24 hours, minimum one hour. We just, like yesterday's dua, you're all there, Mufti Minhaj's dua, mashallah. How long was that? Huh? 45 minutes? 45 minutes? Okay. So, uh, mashallah, what a beautiful, comprehensive dua. The thing is, did he prepare that? Did he have written down? Uh, when you stand in front of Allah and you ask Allah, Ya Allah, please just open up my heart. Allow me to ask you what I should be asking. Did he ask everything he's supposed to, uh, we're supposed to ask? Of course, he asked 10 times more than we usually ask. But still, there's endless of how much you have to ask Allah. Endless. So where is, is going to 45 minute, one hour dua going to come from? That's also going to come from him. So the first dua you say, Ya Allah, allow me to make an accepted one hour dua. And just keep my tongue flowing. Just keep my tongue flowing. Let my heart just speak. And I'll give you one other beautiful thing I learned from my ustad. Is that when you're doing, when you're doing dua, some of the most powerful duas are duas from the heart. We need, you know how we do dhikr from the heart? How you all been feeling that? When you do dhikr of Allah, Allah. You guys been enjoying that? Feeling it, right? When you do Allah, Allah in the heart, right? It's, it's different. It has a, a whole different level of effectiveness than from doing it out loud. Out loud has its own benefits, of course, but doing quietly, closing your eyes and doing Allah, Allah is amazing. Similarly, making dua from the heart is also amazing. How do you do that? You just lift your hand in front of your face and you don't move your lips and you let the heart talk. This is when I traveled and I did, did perform Hajj with my Shaykh. It's exactly in Arafat too. In 50 minutes, an hour, I would stand. I stood next to him. I was like, oh, let me hear the duas. Nothing. With his hands raised, quiet. The Hajj time, I'd, I'd do my own dhikr dua and I'd just join him for the dua. Nothing. He would just keep his hands raised. 45 minutes. Not a word. And this is what he told me. He said, to work on making dua from the heart. It will be, you will feel the results and the benefit of it. You know, in a much higher way. So the Quranic du'as, can, what about Rabbana taqabbal minna? Well, you can say it in your mind. Let your heart do the talking. Rabbana taqabbal minna, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, whatever. So try this, inshallah, on the night of Jummah today. And inshallah, hopefully you'll find it to be very powerful and very beneficial. And once you get a hang of that, then wherever you are, in whichever situation where you cannot raise your hands, where you cannot be vocal and, 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 and move your lips and tongue, your heart can still be doing this powerful du'a. So it goes back to determination. Let's, let's all make dua for one another now. That Ya Allah allow everyone of you who is listening here and who is not listening here but who is in the masjid doing khidmah somewhere else doing ibadah. May Allah allow us to make one hour dua every day in the remaining night. Say Ameen. I want you to say Ameen for me as well. And I say Ameen for you as well. That Allah Azza wa Jal allow us, every one of us here to do at least one hour out of 24 hours just dua. Now you can break it up. Of course, you can do half-half. But there is some special benefit in doing extended period of time. It's building your stamina, your core. And then you can make a habit. Every, every week, one night at least that you can dedicate for dua. One hour. And if that's hard, then say, okay, I'm going to start dedicating 25 minutes after Isha, 25 minutes after Fajr, once a week. That's possible. We think reading Quran is only rewarding. We think, you know, sitting reading a book is very amazing. But we need to create a mahal where we're just sitting there quiet for one hour, just everyone's just making dua. And that is something, inshallah, maybe we should do together. You know, I had intended to, to come up with a time, but I don't know, what's a good time for that? We have very little time, but maybe tonight, maybe we can do that after salawat or something like that. All right, where, or, you know, we can, all right, tonight's my tafsir, actually. So maybe after that, inshallah, we can, uh, instead of having a super extended break, all at least the brothers in Sunnah Atikaf, we can take a half hour break, 45 minutes break, and then we'll come back. It's the night of Jummah. It's the last night of Jummah, the last Jummah of, 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 of the Atikaf and of Ramadan. And we can do a, a dua and then for an hour, everyone. And this is where he comes, I'm t I don't know what to ask. I say, Ye pucho, but bar bar, ya Allah, meri zaban khol de. Oh Allah, open up my tongue. Allow my tongue to flow. I don't know what to say. We just keep on saying this. Just keep on saying this. Ya Allah, inspire me with dua. Inspire me, inspire me, inspire me. And if you don't have a list, I'll write you a list. Right? There's too much stuff to ask. There's too many things in the world. Start off with yourself. Start off with your mom and dad. Start off with your parents. Start off with your siblings, your spouse if you don't have one, then for, to have a spouse. If you have one, then for that. 
right? And then your home, every aspect. Nabi Sallallahu told us to ask for what? Even if your shoelace is broken. Didn't he say that? If your shoelace is broken. So say you're having car problems. How many of you made dua for your car? Say your garage is not working. Say your fridge is having problems. Say your, your dish, or washing machine is, is not cleaning your clothes properly. Who made dua for that? Right? Huh? We don't, right? Let's be honest. We don't. That's a problem. That is the issue. That's a problem. We think, no, the answer is call the plumber. Call this. No, before you do all that stuff, sit and think about all your house problems that you got. All your financial problems that you have. Every single child of yours, if you have many or one or two or whatever, whatever physical, spiritual, emotional, financial issues each one of them have. If they're married, then think about all their issues. By that time, we're not even, we haven't even gotten to the Ummah yet. We haven't even gotten to the Ummah yet. You haven't even gotten to Darus Salam yet, your local madrasa and masjid, the place you're doing atikaf. You haven't even gotten to the teachers and the ulama of the world and all the dini efforts and then the Muslim countries and the Muslims in the various places and the orphans and the widows uh, and all the civil wars and the dhulm that's happening. We haven't even gotten the Masjid Haram, Masjid Aqsa. La ilaha illallah. So we are just not giving enough time into it. This is what I'm saying. I, I'm speaking to myself first and foremost. So let's tonight start off for every day and every night inshallah an hour for that. Where does it, what's the first thing? Why did I go off on this topic? What's the first thing he says you need to do? Determination. There's no way around it. When you make a determination, then you rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, make this azam that I am going to achieve this, inshallah, no, no matter what happens. Or, or, or in azam also, you're going to be asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what's going to happen? This willpower, if you look on YouTube, all these, what do you call this? These goal castings, is that what it is? These, these YouTube channels that are dedicated for inspirational clips, yeah? Some, of, some, some brothers, subhanAllah, they, they binge on these things. They're like, I'm on my sixth one for the day. But the inspiration is only to listen to the next YouTube. Beyond that, it's, it's stuck. So that's what that tells us. Once in a while, definitely is beneficial. It pumps you up. But we should not make a habit of listening, you know, hours end. That defeats the purpose. But the gist of all of those videos is one thing. Yehi chize. That and if we do not control our nafs, and say, I am determined to do this, the whole world put together is not going to help you. Cannot help you. Is that right? Have you heard any of these things? Is that what they tell you? you the, the solution to every problem is determination. I determined that I'm not going to do haram now. I determined that I'm not going to miss salah. I determined I'm going to read the Quran. Once that determination comes in, we will be able to become successful in the dunya and we'll become the successful in the akhirah as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant tawfiq to all of us, inshaAllah. Tiki, what time is iftar today? 35 minutes until Maghrib. 7.48. Tiki, so we have 25 minutes, inshallah, to, to, to do our amal together. Then we can go downstairs. Can someone shut the lights here? Oh. So let's focus today also, inshallah, on some of our quiet, uh, uh, the, uh, some of our dhikr qalbi. One of the aspects of, of um, yeah, one, one of the aspects of muraqaba I want to share right now here is that um, we focus on, get these two also please, Rafi. Uh, that we focus on, today we'll do this, um, to, today moving forward, that we will focus on simply, Allah, instead of, instead of, we'll just focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, straight, Allah azza wa jalla dil pe utara. In Urdu we say faiz. So now, now he loves Allah ka fez. Allah say fez with a dil pe, right? Faya bad. So that is what we should imagine. Fada yafidu means pouring out. Wa fada al ma, right? Water is pouring out. So fayid is actually just the pouring of Allah's mercy, pouring of Allah's nur onto our hearts. We'll do that at the end. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam La ilaha illallah 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 
محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا إله إلا الله 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 محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد 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 صلى الله عليه وسلم استغفر الله 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 الذي لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم واتوب اليه Now let's do dhikr of qalb, inshallah, just Allah, Allah, focusing on the heart. Let's do a little bit longer, inshallah, today, for a couple more minutes. And let us, as we do the dhikr, my beloved brothers and sisters, let's focus on not moving, not uh, being distracted, not coughing, not sneezing, all those things. Try your best. This is self-determination. The urge will come, but control yourself. Allah, 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 Allah.
now inshallah let's let us make it focus on muraqaba as you're waiting for something you're waiting for allah azza wa jal to send his mercy and nur on our hearts alhamdulillah we've been sitting here since asr what a beautiful environment and what amazing tawfiq from allah to be sitting in the same spot we prayed asr we did our dhikr we sat for a one hour talk we did, we're doing dhikr now and now we're asking allah ya allah allow me to feel and sense and receive your special mercy and nur in our hearts and our minds and imagine as this nur is coming in all the blackness of sin because sin has huge amounts of blackness all the evil vulma and darkness layers of darkness of sin from from head to toe is being pushed out and as the nur comes in with it comes a love of allah unparalleled love of love of rasul sallam unparalleled level of love of quran unparalleled that those things are coming into your heart and this darkness is leaving السلام عليكم السلام وبركاته يا ذا جلالي والاكرام اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله اللهم لا نسيت ان عليك انت كما اثنيت على نفسك يا حي يا قيوم يا حي يا قيوم من حقك نستغيث اصلح لنا شأننا كله لا تكن الا انت فسنت الفتعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلاة تنجينا بها من جميع الاحوال والافات وتقديرنا بها جميع الحاجات وتطهرنا بها من جميع السيئات وترفعنا بها عندك على الدرجات وتبلغنا باقصى الغايات من جميع الخيرات في الحياه بعد الممات انك على كل شيء قدير اللهم ربنا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار اللهم ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين اللهم ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنه للقوم الظالمين ونجنا برحمتك من القوم الكافرين ربنا افرغ علينا صبرا وتوفنا مسلمين ربنا افرغ علينا صبرا وتوفنا مسلمين يا الله انسبير اول اوف اس ويت سج دعاز ذات وي شود بي ميكينج ات ذس مومنت او الله الله وسي كولكتيفلي ميك دعاز ذات يو وانت تو ميك كولكتيفلي ان انديفيدجوالي اس ميك دعاز ذات يو وانت تو ميك انديفيدجوالي Oh Allah, we are your servants. Oh Allah, we are your servants. Oh Allah, this tongue is under, under your control. These hands are under your control. Oh Allah, everything, we are, our whole entire existence is under your control. Oh Allah, you've asked us to worship you. You've asked us to supplicate you. You've asked us to beg you. Oh Allah, please inspire us to be able to beg you. Inspire us to be able to ask from you. Inspire us to be able to, to put our head down and beg in front of you, Allah, with our hands raised up, hand extending, Allah. Oh Allah, oh Allah, grant us yaqeen in our du'as. Grant us conviction in our du'as. Allow us to feel and see and sense and have this firm belief that whatever we're asking, you will provide from it in some way or the other. Oh Allah, and that for, there is no way around for us but by asking and begging of you. Ya Allah, we ask you to grant us your muhabbat, grant us your love, grant us your ma'rifah, grant us knowledge of your names and attributes. O oh Allah, allow us to have complete conviction in your powers. O oh Allah, remove all the obstacles from us that exist between us in reaching to you, Ya Allah. In reaching your love, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, make us, make us do such do deeds that will make us worthy of your love. Make us worthy of your love. Make us worthy of your love. O oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to grant us the tawfiq to do all that which Rasul did and invited us towards. And his sunnah of the, the sunnah of the Prophet grant us the tawfiq to be able to, to, be able to practice on that. O oh Allah, grant us the 
pain of the suffering of the ummah and grant us the pain of the deen leaving the minds and the hearts of the people, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, inspire us with the solutions of how to bring deen back in the world and how to raise the banner of, of, of Islam, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, inspire us, Ya Allah, inspire us. O oh Allah, grant us complete shifa from all evil, spiritual, financial, emotional, mental illnesses, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, remove all of our illnesses, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask, Ya Allah, grant us humility and humbleness. Grant us your love, love of the Quran, love of the deen, love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah, grant us the love of all those who loved you and those who loved your Nabi and those, Ya Allah, who, who, whose love will be of worthy for us and in, in attaining your love, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask, Ya Allah, to grant us the ability to value our time every moment, Ya Allah. Allow us to speak less and eat less and, and sleep less. And allow us to utilize the remaining days, Ya Allah, in the absolute best of the best of the best ibadah, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, allow us to find Lilatul Qadr, Ya Allah. And allow us to make ibadah the night of Jum'ah, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, whatever intentions the brothers and sisters have been making, Ya Allah, grant them qubudi and acceptance, Ya Allah. Subhana Rabbik Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifun. Wa salamun al mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. We can make, inshallah, our, our individual dua for another 10 minutes, and then we can head downstairs.